This is National Nine News with Peter Hitchener. Good evening. A report from the Bangladesh capital, Dakar, says tidal waves have washed all 10,000 people from a small island into the Bay of Bengal. The report says that so far only four people have been rescued and little hope is held for the survival of the others. It quotes officials in Dakar as saying that a plane flew over the island and called in that everything had been swept away. The official death toll from the cyclone in southern Bangladesh is 248. Victorian farmers say changes to the assets test don't go far enough to resolve its anomalies. Social Security Minister Brian Howe today announced reforms in the administration of the assets test, mainly affecting rural pensions. But the Farmers and Graces Association says the legislation will have to be changed, not just its administration. More from Peter Harvey. So far, about 50,000 pensioners, that's about 2.5% of the national total, have had their benefits reduced or withdrawn because of the controversial test. But in some country areas, the percentage hit has been as high as 7%, and today's changes are aimed primarily at country people. From now on, farms or properties will be exempt from the assets test if they've been lived on or worked for 20 years. They'll also be exempt if they've been worked on by a close relative for 10 years or more. And the pension loan scheme, which allows people to receive pension, which are later repaid, has been made more attractive. Loan repayments can now be made in instalments with interest rates at a fixed 10%. Opposition leader Andrew Peacock has been quick to say that these changes are meaningless. Something, of course, Brian Howe rejects. It's all very well to say uh, we'll scrap it to bring in uh, private members' bills and so on. I believe that uh, he's not serious. I think he knows that uh, pensions have to be means tested. This government has been prepared to be tough, to be fair. Secret radio broadcasts from East Timor indicate that Indonesia still has not put down local resistance. Fretland freedom fighters have restored radio contact with Australia after a break of several years. And it seems that after 10 years of Indonesian occupation, the bloodshed continues. This is the sound of Fretland radio, broadcasting from the troubled territory of East Timor, some 500 kilometres north of Australia. The rebels have been active since the mid-70s when Indonesia annexed the former Portuguese colony in a bloody struggle. Australia lost contact in 1978 when transmitting equipment was surrendered. Now Fretland supporters are monitoring the new broadcasts from secret bush locations around Darwin. They're anxious that their own radio gear doesn't fall into the hands of federal police who have previously confiscated similar equipment. They say the stream of information makes a mockery of the Indonesian government's story that all is well in East Timor. One politician who welcomes the new communication with Fretland forces is West Australian Labor Senator Gordon McIntosh. He says the East Timor crisis has been too readily forgotten. It's not going to disappear. You can't sweep it under the carpet. It seems very nice and tidy and it might suit Indonesia and it may suit uh, other governments as well to say, well, let's forget about it. They're not going to forget about it and personally I'm not going to forget about it while there's people struggling for survival. Iran has vowed to turn the Iraqi capital Baghdad into a hell in reprisal for an air attack on Tehran. The Iranian High Defense Council warned Iraqis to evacuate Baghdad and accused Iraq of responsibility for explosions in unnamed neighboring countries in a bid to obtain financial aid. The Soviet Union has set up a committee to defend Bulgarian Sergei Antonov, who's charged with complicity in the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul in 1980. Antonov goes on trial in Rome tomorrow. Moscow has repeatedly denied that either it or its Soviet satellite Bulgaria was involved in any way, but the Italian government claims the murder bid was an international plot. Richard Roth of CBS News is in Italy for the trial. These are the people who decide the case. Six jurors and two judges assigned to determine whether agents from Bulgaria, perhaps directed by Moscow, were partners four years ago in a plot to kill the Pope. The trial will open here in a specially designed courtroom known as the Bunker, a fortress lined with jail cells to hold the defendants, including Turkish gunman Mehmet Ali Aja. Aja in court four years ago swore he was acting alone when he fired the shots that nearly killed John Paul. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, but a year later he changed his story. From a cell in a maximum security prison, Aja began confessing to a conspiracy that came to be called the Bulgarian Connection. 
His testimony is now the backbone of the Italian government's case, outlined in a 1,200-page secret court document obtained by CBS News. Aja said the conspiracy began in Sofia, Bulgaria, the Vitosha Hotel. He was a convict on the run, recruited, he claims, into a network of Turkish criminals and Bulgarian secret agents, and finally offered half a million dollars to kill John Paul II. A fear that the Polish Pope was a dangerous threat to Soviet authority in Eastern Europe gave Bulgaria a motive, according to an Italian state prosecutor. The suggestion is that Moscow ultimately was behind the plan, but that theory will not be tested in court. No Russians are on trial, only five Turks and three Bulgarians. Todor Ivasov and Jelio Vasilev former Bulgarian embassy employees in Rome. Aja claims they helped arrange the shooting. Both are now back in Bulgaria, beyond the reach of Italian law. And Sergei Antonov, Aja said he was to drive the getaway car. 43 years ago this week, World War II reached southern Australia, and 19 men died in a Japanese attack on Sydney Harbour. Today, the Navy remembered that night. It was a night that those who experienced it will never forget. In a daring attack, three Japanese midget submarines entered Sydney Harbour. A torpedo aimed at an American warship missed and hit the Australian vessel HMAS Cuttable. Nineteen lives were lost, two of the midget submarines were destroyed, the third disappeared without a trace. Today, at a naval service, that night was clearly remembered. Then, later outside, at Cuttable Steps, the service continued. A wreath was placed on harbour waters and a bugler sounded the last post. And as Sydney was remembering its war experiences, the English were reliving the Dunkirk evacuation of 45 years ago. And more than 40 of the Dunkirk little ships, including the London Fire Brigade Massey Shore, crossed the channel to the French beaches to mark the occasion. In 1940, the Massey Shore three times defied German shelling, bombing an aircraft to bring back hundreds of British soldiers. But tonight, she and the little boats will tie up in Dunkirk for the first time for a more friendly reception. Elizabeth Hayes, National Nine News. The England selectors have made a surprise admission from the 13-man squad for the one-day series against Australia beginning on Thursday. Former rebel tourist of South Africa, John Embury, has been left out with another rebel, Peter Willey, his replacement. Opening batsman Graham Gooch also returns after a three-year exile. Melbourne's weather, fine, mild and mainly sunny tomorrow, a top of 20 after an overnight low of 8 degrees, currently 13 in town. And that's all the news for now. Don Lunn will be here throughout the night with news breaks. Till I see you again, it's good night.